first of all, um, we have uh, here next to me is Erica from the Asian Institute um, of Management and doing a lot of specialization in, um, in, in data and, and, and related um, issues. Um, and just in terms of perhaps something, perhaps something, because I asked everyone, just to let you into the secret, I asked everyone, we can all read all the bios, so just tell us something that we may not know. Eric is a rather stand us all by saying, I love to travel. Yeah, lots of us love to travel. I got kidnapped in Myanmar. And I used game theory to escape. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to hearing how Eric is going to respond to, to all of this. Um, we've got Candy from, um, from Beijing, who has started uh, her own business um, in the applications of AI in terms of, of, of gaming. Amongst many other claims to fame, she was the Chinese chess champion at the age of 10 and again at the age of 12, um, which I think is pretty phenomenal. Um, but if that's not enough, um, she has um, been recognized by the World Economic Forum as one of the global shapers um, of the future. And actually, Kathy hopes literally to be out of this world, to go into space next year as part of um, a, a, a kind of uh, space for humanity. Um, so again, um, great expertise to tap into. Last but by no means least, uh, the other gent on the platform. Fantastic that we've got some really good balanced panels um, in this conference. That is something a lot of our conference organisers can, can learn from, what's happening here. But Raoul from the Centre of the Creative Industries and Artificial Intelligence, Centre of Expertise in Canada. So anyone else here from Canada today? Yeah? Shout out there, have a bit of noise, come on! No, oh, Canada. Um, so Raul um, is a part of a business he wanted in the past. His mum was a teacher, like mine was. He wanted to be a teacher himself, but now he's teaching machines how to think. So, Perhaps I can start with, with Eric, and you've heard the perspective from Aisha. Are you optimistic about the future for work? Yes, of course. Super optimistic, in fact. Uh, I had a chat earlier with one of the persons at the back about AI. I think one of the big issues that we are really facing is that people don't really understand what AI is, right? I really blame Hollywood for this one. Um, when, when we talk about AI, people think of sentient machines. These are machines that can interact, have social intelligence. The fact is, it's very, very far to the future. We're not there yet. So I really, I, that's why us, we really do artificial intelligence. We code, we program, we've seen how technology has evolved and we're very excited because it can help our businesses, our processes become more efficient, right? And the routinary jobs, um, they will be more e efficient and optimized with artificial intelligence. Great, thank you. Kathy, what's, what's your perspective in terms of the future of work and AI? Oh, I, I'm absolutely positive. I just like to see how I love the fact that this is a panel on AI and the four of the panelists, three are the girls. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I echo what Eric says, uh, I think um, when people talk about AI, they don't really understand what AI is and also um, it is, a, it is a, I think, a lot of hype and also lots of misunderstanding and also personally, I don't think, first of all, uh, we are not at the stage, we are far away from that stage, uh, AI is going to replace human and becoming the master of humans. Uh, a, a machine, uh, let's say, take, taking uh, vision recognition as uh, one example, uh, we are at the best stage to identify cats. Uh, that, uh, well, we are past that, but, but somewhere around that. And uh, also, I think uh, it's not about the question when we talk about future, it's necessarily a human versus machine. Um, I, I think the future to me is more than human or working to work, uh, working together with machine to solve some of the most um, challenging problems we're going to face. And Raul, are you positive as well? Um, so I'm like a short-term pessimist, long-term optimist, if that makes sense. 
uh, you know, I work in my, at Microsoft Research in Canada, so all the work we end up doing is focus on natural language understanding, teaching machines how to read, how to communicate, and you do see a lot of examples of you know people taking advantage of the, advantage of these technologies in the short term to spread fake news, uh, to you know a lot of abuse on the internet. Uh, so in the short term, you know there's a bunch of things that we need to overcome, but in the long term, I do believe that you know like uh, like you said, it's more about how do we get humans and machines to work together? How do we get them to cooperate together? You know what humans are really really good at is communicating with each other about being creative. Uh, so if you look at human history, what separates us from the other species, other animal species, is our ability to communicate. Uh, so verbal communication allowed us to uh, share ideas and thoughts. Written communication allowed us to actually build upon each other's thoughts. Right? So I can read a book from 100 years ago, think about it, and have my own thought on top of it. Uh, so as can we get that these skills into machines, can we get them to read and understand text the way human beings do, but also take what machines are really, really good at, which is ingesting a large amount of data, right? So knowledge is doubling every 18 months. Um, so for example, in medical in a medical situation, there might be so much new research coming out that a doctor will never be able to keep up with it ever in their lifetime. But machines are really, really good at that. Um, so if you combine the two together and have a doctor work with a machine, they can actually help get your diagnosis a lot faster. We can help cure people a lot faster. Um, so it, it, I don't think it needs to be humans versus machines, uh, like you said. Now, you're all really digital natives. I'm part of the, the kind of the digital migrant <laughs> generation. Um, so. I probably speak for a lot of people, both in this room and around the world, who are struggling to keep a hold on the future and are both excited, but also, frankly, a bit scared. Why? How do we make sure, because you're, you're all seeing the amazing possibilities, how do we ensure that we don't end up with a greater and greater digital divide? Do we just have to accept that, particularly, all us older folk are going to have to be written off and we're going to just have to be passive recipients of this great new world? Or do you think that it's the responsibility of society and of businesses and of academic institutions to be more proactive at trying to avoid a greater digital divide? No, I think that's a really good question and I think it is our responsibility to do that but not in a patronizing way. I hate ageism of any kind, uh, for young people or older people. And I think there's a lot of value in, there's no retirement age as far as I can see now. Um, as people grow older, they have a lot of expertise, they have domain knowledge, and it is up to the government to do the matchmaking and for nonprofits and other activists for us to find ways to educate them on how to be part of a diversified team. And I can't emphasize enough that any team that does technology is not only made up of techies. Um, is to bring them in, find that position for them, and to educate them in the ways that are needed. And for that you know, friction that we will have between when they have a job and while they're learning to assimilate into this new world, we would need to provide some kind of support for them. Yeah, I think uh, we have to be proactive. Uh, that's why it's one of the things that I'm really proud of coming back to the Philippines because I was in Singapore for six years, is uh, the Asian Institute of Management, thanks to our president and team, Ji Kyung Han, they really pushed for data science as a field. Uh, because for this to really work, I think there should be a triumvirate, a working like industry, government, academic, academic institutions, really working closely together. Because if it's just the academics who will do it without interacting with industries, we will be very theoretical, right? Like what you mentioned earlier. Um, so in the Philippines, with more universities and more agencies and companies working together for the entire society. I was really fascinated in our delegates' pack to see that, that brochure, the data science uh, master's program. Are you teaching some of the ethics involved as part, an integral part of that master's program, or is that 
something that you just assume is. No, you cannot. Uh, yeah, exactly. You cannot just teach data science without ethics. That I, I believe that this is really important. And you know, one of the first questions that was asked to me, like, why would you teach data science in a business school, right? But I think it's the perfect institution to start data science because what we want to create are technical people who understand the language of business, who understand where these tools can be applied, and also the ethics. Because data science and AI, these are just tools, right? Just like hammer. You can use it to build homes or to break whatever, right? So yeah, we, we do teach this and it's part of the curriculum. Candy, any, any thoughts on this digital divide? Uh, well, I, I actually I want to answer this question with uh, two stories, uh, if I may. Uh, because as a chess player, we all know, I think one of the fear created by, um, by by media or by news is that we see all those uh, news at all, and chess uh, player were beaten by AI and go like was smashed by AI. And, we wonder, oh, when I'm gonna be smashed by AI? Maybe just tomorrow or the day next tomorrow. So, of course, the first story is that we all know in 1997, this guy called Gara Kasparov, a human, was beaten by Deep Blue, a machine. Uh, and that was, uh, I think that was too many. That was uh, like marked as a dome of the new era that AI is going to become our masters. But here we are 20 years on, later on, probably the greatest change we interact with machines, uh, iPhone and iPad. Uh, and, and the next story is in 2005, uh, this is a freestyle chess um, tournament where a human and machine, they can enter um, as partners. Uh, rather than opponents, if they may choose. So you might all think, oh, so who are going to be the champion? You might think, oh, it uh, must be the, the grandmaster who is a supercomputer, which at the beginning, supercomputer was beaten by grandmaster with a relatively lousy computer. But the champion, surprisingly, is actually two American amateurs with three relatively weak uh, laptops, but their ability to coach and manipulate uh, the computers to deeply um, explore some of the, the uh, precise positions on the chessboard and uh, disappear or counteract it to the superior knowledge of the grandmas and superior computational power of the, 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 the computers. So again, back to the question, uh, Am I how how we're working together? I mean, to 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 face a future. So I think it's it's more of a yeah. So if it, instead of AI, it's probably more of IA. It's a, 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 that's a one term I like to sometimes to be. It's a intelligence uh, augmentation. Uh, 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 so yeah, that's why. I actually just want to build on that, so I use AI as, or IA as well, but I call it intelligence amplification. Uh, so ampl amplifying human intelligence, you're not really replacing the jobs, uh, you're amplifying what humans can do. Um, as for the digital divide itself, um, I think it's actually great that more and more people are connected, more and more people have, uh, you know, super, almost supercomputers in the palm of their hands. Uh, we can get so much more done. Um, as a society, uh, so I mean, yes, there are worries that you will lose your jobs when the process we're creating so many more jobs that you don't see. You know, there's hundreds and thousands of data scientists that com top companies are hiring, but that doesn't include all the other data scientists that every company in the world is going to need in the next five, ten years. Um, you know, we don't ever talk about the data that goes behind powering these um, these algorithms, this data actually needs to be annotated, needs to be cleaned up by actually like hundreds of thousands of human beings behind the scenes. But no one really talks about the jobs that AI is creating. Everyone's worried about what's going to happen when AI takes over those jobs. So again, I just want to say, in the short term, I think we'll be okay. But again, like conversations like these where we all come together and really talk about uh, do we, like, what regulations do we need to make sure 
everyone has, everyone gets paid. Uh, so like, where does UBI come in, universal basic income? Do people need to get paid a minimum amount globally so that once AI comes, it does take over some of these mundane, repetitive jobs. People still have the money to sustain a life, but now they can go be, be, more create, be more creative and do what human beings are really good at, which is problem solving, as opposed to answering the same question about, you know, my phone broke day in, day out. We were talking briefly over lunch about that, that question about the universal basic income. And I know some business organizations around the world are starting to think about what would be the implications of such a move. You have experiments in places like Finland, you have various think tanks around the world who are asking, again, how to make such a, a system work. Does it encourage people to be lazy or is it part of the kind of the social quid pro quo, a, a social license to operate. You may have views on that and all the other things that we've been talking about so far. And in just a few moments, I would like to encourage some quick fire questions and some equally quick fire comments from around the room. So if you would like to be part of the conversation in a more active way, if again, you could go to the different uh, microphone points and um, I will come to you in a few moments if I could actually see because the lights are so um, strong at the moment I can't quite see where the, the microphone stands are but whilst you're thinking of your thoughts and moving to the microphones if you would like to be part of the conversation perhaps I could ask all of our panel this question so you've all clearly put your cards on the table all real sort of optimists, even if it's short-term pessimism, in order to get to the long-term optimism. But you are all, all optimistic. Um, we've started to talk about some of the kinds of skills that you're going to need to not just survive in this brave new world, but also to thrive. And I think some of the things I was hearing in the last few minutes were around the ability to be able to operate in teams much more, and those teams will include the IA, um, whether that's for a doctor or for its, it's the, the lawyers using Revel and, and, and everything else. Um, but apart from collaboration skills, and obviously the technical <laughs> basics of, of, of understanding um, the, 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 these new technologies, are there some other crucial skills you would say absolutely. I'm going to turn first to our colleague from AIM, Erica. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you, David. I think I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate about this. It's the skill to learn. I think that's the most important aspect. Like This is the skill that everybody needs to learn, which is the skill to learn. Especially that we are now in the age where things are moving very fast. Things are evolving very fast, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. If, if we don't know how to learn, if we're going to adapt, then that's going to be a big problem. That's why in our program we also have, uh, it's very practitioner oriented, right? It's like we throw your problem, solve that, and then we don't just teach you the specific tools, but you, you have the internet out there. Learn how to learn. So um, Possibly also be able to learn to forget some things as well. As oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so it's it, it's it's the the ability to to learn and to relearn a lot, but it's obviously also that hunger to do so. Yep. Kathy, and anything you would add in terms of skills? Uh, well, um, I mean, I tend to think. Uh, well, I'm, I'm kind of person I tend to think this generation is no different than. Last generation, of course, in the contents, a lot has changed. But fundamentally, and uh, also compared to the next generation, because as a human being, even though okay, we we see why in the times of AI, uh, but we also in the last generation we sent men to the moon. And I'm sure at that that time, I mean, the crowd was also panic. So are we going to the moon? Are we? So I I don't think we are in that much difference. So. And in terms of uh, the, the um, skills or in terms of basic humanities that make human so wonderful, so creative, I don't think that every got change. First of all, one thing is curiosity. It's, uh, uh, so that, that involves a uh, lifelong 
uh, learning. It's uh, you don't learn because you need to pass the exam, so you need to get good scores. You need to. You sometimes you learn purely for your talent, for your intellectual pressures. Imagine life without learning. How dual can it be? Um, so I think that was one. Second one, I would say is uh, um, persevere. Is uh, you're gonna fail a lot, especially talk about. Um, what you want to do that, you are good at creativity, you are good at, you are good at feeling, because a machine are good at things with a high rate of accuracy, mathematics, uh, computation, we are very, pretty bad at large scales and volumes, but we are good at feeling, because all the feelings we, yeah, you imagine any great inventions that uh, are that, the that result, that's, uh, that's a child's first after 1,000, 10,000 failures, if we're lucky. So I think that's what we need to do.